these systems under USAI from the private sector rather, rather than pulling them out of our own stocks, which is what we do with PDA. By its very nature, this USAI package underscores our commitment to supporting Ukraine for the long term, representing a multi-year investment in critical defense capabilities. This package is about building enduring strength for Ukraine as it continues to defend its sovereignty in the face of Russian aggression. Vladimir Putin seems to believe that Russia can win the long game, outlasting the Ukrainians and their will to fight, and the international community's will to continue to support Ukraine. This USAI package is a tangible demonstration that this is yet another Russian miscalculation. The, cap the capabilities in this package are tailored to sustain Ukraine's most critical capability needs in the medium to long term, and they include six additional National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems, or NASAMs, with additional munitions for those NASAMs, up to 245,000 rounds of 155mm artillery ammunition, which is the ammunition used for the NATO standard uh, artillery systems that have been transferred to Ukraine. Up to 65,000 rounds of 120 millimeter mortar ammunition, up to 24 uh, counter artillery radars. We're also uh, including in this package Puma Unmanned Aerial Systems, or UAS, and support equipment for Scan Eagle UAS systems. We're including Vampire Counter Unmanned Aerial Systems, Laser Guided Rocket Systems and a substantial funding package for training, maintenance, and sustainment so that Ukraine can keep the equipment they already have in the fight. Deliveries of this USAI package will begin in the next several months and continue over the coming years. While many of these capabilities are not intended uh, direct to directly contribute to today's fight, they will form the backbone of a robust future U Ukrainian force capable of defending Ukraine for years to come. Stepping back for a moment, the United States has now committed more than $13.5 billion in security assistance to Ukraine since the beginning of the Biden administration, including $12.9 billion in the last six months. This level of U.S. security assistance is historically unprecedented and demonstrates our unwavering support for a free and democratic Ukraine on its Independence Day. This may be our largest security assistance package to date, but let me be clear, it will not be our last. We will continue to closely consult with Ukraine on its near, mid, and long-term capability needs. We are far from alone in this effort. As I noted in my last briefing earlier this month, at least 50 countries have now provided billions of dollars worth of additional security assistance to Ukraine since Russia invaded and participated uh, in, invaded in, uh, in February. And these allies and partners have participated in the monthly Ukraine defense contact group meetings that have been hosted by Secretary Austin. Our continued unified efforts will help Ukraine continue to be successful today and build enduring strength to ensure the Ukrainian people are able to commemorate many more Independence Days for years to come. And with that, I think we're going to take the first question from the AP. Thank you, sir. Lita? Thank you. Um, so one sort of specific question and then uh, a broader question. Um, the vampires, can you give us a, a, a sense of how far down the road that is, what kind of what a little more detail what they are and how far down the road that is because I think it's a fairly new system. And then more broadly, can you tell us how much of the package is on tr would, would fund training and is the U.S. going to expand training? Give us a, a picture of U.S. training for Ukraine down the road into the future. Yeah, so the, the Vampire system itself is a counter UAS system. It is a kinetic system. It uses a small uh, missiles, essentially, to shoot UAVs uh, out of the sky, and we're happy to provide you more technical details uh, from the right experts uh, at the right time. Um, as it relates to training, you know, we continue to train uh, Ukrainian forces on all the systems that we uh, are providing and that our allies and partners are providing um, uh, that they haven't already been trained on. So as they've made kind of a transition from, in uh, many cases, Soviet legacy equipment to NATO standard equipment, that's required more uh, training. And this has been happening on a rolling basis. Uh, now, as it relates to systems in this package, since really we're talking about systems that will take months to get on contract and, you know, one, two, three years in some instances to arrive in Ukraine, uh, we think we're confident we, we have the time to train the Ukrainians on whatever systems, uh, you know, they're not already familiar with. Do, but, uh, do 
you know how much of the package is? is oh, on the sustainment training? On the training. Well, the, yeah, the sustainment package, sorry, the, uh, the, I answer it as it relates to training. The piece of it that's about sustainment, I'll get you the exact numbers uh, on that afterwards, but sustainment is really about spare parts. Uh, the things that help them with uh, with maintenance. Is there a number for the training, though? For training. I don't have the number in front of me. I can give you that. Yeah. Okay, let's go to Adam. Abraham Abraham Air Force Magazine. Thank you so much. Uh, can you tell us uh, why still no aircraft or pilot training uh, if you're thinking medium and long term? And also, um, why not include some systems like the ATACMS, the ATACMS, the Army Tactical Missile Systems, with ranges beyond 80 kilometers, since Russia is now moving their logistics and command and control beyond the range of the, the current munitions that we're sending. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so as it relates to aircraft, um, our current priority uh, as it relates to aircraft is making sure that Ukrainians can use the aircraft they currently have to generate effects uh, in the current conflict. So, uh, for example, the last time we uh, had a briefing here, uh, we broke some news in talking about the fact that we had provided them uh, some of these anti-radiation uh, missiles, the HARM missiles, uh, and um, we had adapted those missiles to be able to fire off MiG-29s. They, of course, were not designed to fly off Russian equipment. They were uh, uh, they were uh, designed to fly off our uh, aircraft. And the Ukrainians uh, in recent weeks have been using uh, the HARM missiles to great effect uh, to take out Russian uh, radar systems. So, you know, as it relates to future aircraft, fourth generation aircraft, for example, uh, even if we were to provide those now, they wouldn't they wouldn't arrive for years. So we've been focused on as it relates to their fighter aircraft on what they need for the to support the current uh, efforts to hold in the east and and perhaps go on a, on a counteroffensive. As it relates to the future uh, of aircraft, let me tell you where we are in the process. So Secretary Austin has tasked uh, uh, the Office of Secretary of Defense to work with the Joint Staff and European Command, essentially on a future forces uh, picture of kind of the Ukrainian force for the mid to long term. Obviously, this is done in close consultation with the Ukrainians. It is, after all, uh, uh, their military. Uh, and we're really trying to be very deliberate and disciplined about um, what type of Ukrainian force matters in the next 12, 24, 36 months under any range of scenarios. It could be a scenario in which uh, the war continues. It could be a scenario in which uh, the violence uh, uh, ebbs um, uh, because there's an agreement or because uh, it, it just dies down uh, a bit. Um, but in, even in that instance, the Ukrainians are going to need to defend their territory and deter future aggression. So we're trying to be very deliberate about what systems uh, we think makes the most sense for Ukraine to have in that context. And it also matters very much, can they sustain it? Can they afford it? Uh, because, of course, you know, billions of dollars of international assistance is not is is you know may not be something ten years from now or twenty years from now. So these also have to be uh, systems that Ukraine itself can sustain. But I can tell you that uh, fighter aircraft remain on the table. Just no final decisions uh, have been made about that. Yeah, as it relates to attack them. So uh, I think as most of you uh, are tracking, um, you know, we've been we've provided 16 HIMARS systems, uh, which are precision uh, rocket, uh, multiple launch rocket systems. A number of other allies have provided similar systems. The, the Brits and the Germans in particular have provided M270 systems. The HIMARS is a truck. It launches the rockets off the back. The M270s launches the same rockets, but essentially off the chassis of a Bradley fighting vehicle type of armored uh, vehicle. Um, we have provided them uh, uh, guided multiple launch rocket systems or Gimlers that have a range uh, of, you know, around 70 or 80 uh, kilometers. We have provided them with hundreds and hundreds of these precision guided systems, and the Ukrainians have um, been using them to extraordinary effect on the battlefield. It's our assessment that the most relevant munitions for the current fight are the Gimlers. And so we have prioritized getting the Ukrainians the Gimlers they need, not only to um, uh, hold in the east, but may generate some momentum uh, elsewhere in the country. It's our assessment that they don't currently require attackums to serve as targets that are directly relevant uh, to the current fight. Um, you know, we'll obviously continue to have conversations with the Ukrainians about about their needs, but it's our judgment at the moment uh, that we should be focusing on Gimlers, not attackums. Thank you. That's okay. Sorry, Abraham. We're going to move on. We'll go to AFP, and then we'll go out to the phone line. Sylvie. Um, thank you. Uh, speaking about Gimlers, uh, you uh, there is uh, you mentioned laser guided rocket system. I suppose it's it's them. Uh, can you uh, say um, how how many and how long they are supposed to to last? Uh, how how long does it's going to take for them to receive them, and for how long? 
Yeah, I mean, so it's going to take, um, so you're asking about the rocket systems in particular, correct? Let me make sure I have all the information for you. So the laser, the laser guided rocket systems provided in this tranche of funding um, will basically complement the systems that Ukrainians already have been provided in previous security assistance packages. The, the, uh, the specific rocket systems have a range of about eight kilometers, uh, and they can be used uh, to basically to target Russian capabilities like armor, personnel carriers, and unmanned uh, aerial systems. In terms of the delivery timeline, uh, some of those systems and rounds will probably be provided to the Ukrainians within the next nine months, and additional systems and rounds uh, could take a year or two. So you mean that it's uh, there? There are no gimlers there. There are no gimlers in this package. No, Why? the way that well, because the because we've been focusing on uh, providing gimlers through the PDA packages. So the most recent, so we've been in we in every just about every PDA package, uh, we have provided a steady stream of of gimlers, hundreds and hundreds uh, at a time. Um, it's our assessment that the Ukrainian stocks of gimlers are pretty good right now, and we're going to continue to provide those. But but remember the distinction I drew before about you know PDA is essentially something we can draw it out of our own stocks to make it. A, not immediately available, but usually in the matter of days or weeks, uh, whereas USII is typically months or years. Okay, let's go to the phone lines. Do we have uh, Tom Squatiri from Red Snow News? Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, doctor, could you just give, give us a little more clarity, please, on the timeline? There has been some delays in the past of contracting uh, equipment for delivery to Ukraine. Um, could you just be, be a little more specific on the timeline, please? Thank you. A timeline for a particular system you're interested in because the timelines are all different for the various timelines well let me rephrase let me rephrase the question then have, have has the pentagon experienced any difficulties in contracting in the past for these kind of weapons and if so has that been factored into the timeline yeah i mean well i mean the short answer is we're eager to get the ukrainians the systems as quickly as the process will allow um we it takes sometimes months to get these uh, uh systems on uh contract um, that's been the case with the NASAMs, uh, for uh, for example. Um, so in each case, we will endeavor to get the contracts uh, uh, filled out as quickly as possible and get stuff on the road. But I think we have to manage people's expectations. This package is, the, the package of capabilities here are really aimed at getting Ukraine uh, what they're going to need in the medium to long term. So it's not relevant to the fight today, tomorrow, next week. It is relevant to the ability of Ukraine to defend itself and deter further aggression a year from now, two years from now. And this is this is actually extraordinarily important uh, because, as, at least as we can discern, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin has not given up on his overall strategic objectives of seizing most of Ukraine, toppling the regime, uh, reclaiming Ukraine as part of a new uh, Russian empire. What he has done is lengthened his timeline in recognition that uh, he's off plan. Uh, uh, and so as a consequence, his theory of victory is that he can wait everybody out. He can wait the Ukrainians out because they'll be exhausted and attrited. He can wait us out because we'll turn our attention uh, uh, elsewhere. He can wait the Europeans out because of high energy prices or whatever. Uh, and so packages like this are extraordinarily important in directly challenging Putin's theory of the case, which is that we're not in it for the long haul, that we aren't supporting Ukraine for the long haul. So um, the other uh, value in US, using the USAI money is that, you know, there, when we take things about out of our own stocks, we're taking things out of our own stocks, and that puts certain constraints on what we can provide on what timelines. When we do USAI, we are buying stuff uh, on contract, and therefore the private sector can produce uh, can produce these things. Thanks, but it takes Tom. a longer time. We'll go to Tara and then to Nancy. Thank you, um, Tara. Defense one. Um, Dr. Paul, do you, does the building's assessment now that this war is winnable for Ukraine, um, and that's why there's this announcement of this multi-year U.S. will continue to provide these arms in the long term, and then can you provide some context? Is this not only the biggest tranche to date for Ukraine, but is this the biggest security assistance package provided in any conflict individually um, for Afghanistan and Iraq? I realize that might take some time to, uh, to put in context. 
Yeah, yeah. the latter question, I think I, my sense is it is historically unusual, uh, whether it's historically unprecedented and it's in its sheer size. I think we're going to have to get back back to you on it. It's also it may not be an apples to apples comparison uh, in terms of the types of things. USAI is not equivalent to, you know, uh, foreign military uh, funding, uh, for example. Um, so anyway, let's get back to you on whether it's the biggest of all time. Um, I think the sheer amount of security assistance we've provided through a combination of PDA and uh, USAI is historically unprecedented as far as we can tell, because we're now north of $13 billion uh, uh, with this and, you know, uh, $12.9 billion just since the, uh, uh, the invasion kicked off on, on February uh, 24th. In terms of the relevant, in terms of essentially, does does the package represent some assessment about the end game? I think the shortest answer to that is no. Uh, it's actually agnostic to what the war, uh, what the you know the end game is. Obviously, it's important for us uh, that uh, that Ukraine uh, survives and endures as a democratic, uh, independent, uh, uh, sovereign country uh, with its territorial integrity uh, intact. It's important to us that uh, that Russia pays a cost in excess of the benefits they gain from aggression, so that they don't do it again, uh, and so that other aggressors uh, uh, take that lesson. It's also important to us that that uh, Vladimir Putin's objective of weakening the West and fragmenting NATO actually is turned on its head, uh, that NATO emerges stronger, the free world emerges stronger. I think we're on track to achieve all three of those objectives, an a, a, a independent, sovereign, democratic Ukraine that endures, a Russia uh, that has paid more costs than benefits, and a West uh, that is uh, stronger than uh, when this started. Um, this type of uh, package does not presume uh, any particular outcome of the conflict in Ukraine. So, for example, uh, if the war continues uh, for years, this package is relevant. Uh, if there is a ceasefire or a peace uh, settlement, this package is still relevant uh, because Ukraine needs the ability to defend itself and deter uh, future aggression. So kind of under any uh, uh, scenario or all the ones in between, we think uh, that the package is relevant. Okay, we'll go to Nancy and then we'll go out to the phone lines. A couple of things you said earlier. Um, you talked about the strikes in Syria. There have been yeah. reports of additional U.S. strikes in Syria. Can you give us any additional information about that? Also, um, you received questions. Sorry, there are three. Um, you also had questions about training, um, how much of this was dedicated training. You, you said you couldn't give us a number. Can you give us a sense of how many people would be trained and over what time period? And finally, you talked about this as a, a, an investment in Ukraine's military in the medium to long term. I think you talked about three years. Is it your assessment that at three years that Ukraine will be fully um, integrated into the NATO, into NATO uh, weapon systems? Do you anticipate they will no longer need Soviet um, weapons systems at that point? Can you, can you give us a picture of what you envision the Ukrainian military looking, at, looking like at the end of this weapons package? Thank you. Yeah. So just on this, on the Syria strikes, we're tracking the same reports uh, you are, that there's been an exchange uh, 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 in Syria. I don't have any details to provide you. At, when, when we have more, we'll, we'll give you more. I will say as a general matter, uh, we're not going to hesitate to defend ourselves. And uh, we've communicated this uh, both in the actions that were took uh, last night, the nature of those actions, um, and also what we have communicated uh, uh, to uh, the Iranians. We're not going to tolerate attacks by Iran-backed forces uh, on our forces uh, anywhere in the world, uh, to include in Syria. Uh, and we won't hesitate to protect ourselves uh, and take additional measures as appropriate. Now, in this particular case, um, our response was, I think, uh, extraordinarily carefully calibrated. It was meant to be proportional to the attacks that the Iran-backed groups carried out on August 15th. It was very precise. Uh, we had uh, essentially scoped out 11 bunker targets on this site. We ended up prosecuting nine of them because uh, uh, shortly before the strike, um, there was new evidence that there might be uh, individuals near two of the other bunkers. So we held off striking those out of an abundance of caution because our goal was not to produce casualties in this instance. But we will continue to respond if our people are uh, are, are attacked. Uh, and But as it relates to the additional reports, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you more when we know more. Um, as it relates to the training numbers, I don't have the specific numbers uh, in front of me. Nancy, we'll, we'll get back to you with, with whatever details you need for, uh, for your, your story uh, on that. At three years, will we be done, you know, will the Ukrainians be done transitioning to NATO standard equipment? You know, 
my sense is they will large they will still have some aspects you know for example they have hundreds and hundreds of 152 millimeter uh, uh, artillery systems they also have considerable industrial capacity it is conceivable that years from now they could still be using those systems produced by uh, you know using munitions that they themselves produce I will say though I would anticipate that um, in the time frame we're talking about here that Ukraine will gradually transition to NATO standard equipment you're already seeing that um, in the transition to the M777 howitzers and other similar systems like the French Caesar system that use the 155 millimeter uh, systems. There's, you know, HIMARS uh, is another example, some of the UAS uh, systems. I think one of the things that will be, you know, important as, as we think through this uh, alongside Ukraine in the coming years is how can we, and Secretary Austin is very uh, seized with this, is what does the future force of Ukraine look like that's sustainable? Uh, and the reality is that in the six months of this war, um, it's been an all hands on deck situation, right? Uh, security assistance flowing in from more than 50 countries. But that also means dozens of systems. And ideally, the Ukrainian military of the future will not be rooted in dozens of different systems, but a much smaller number of systems uh, that are, uh, you know, easier to sustain and maintain and all that. So, you know, let's see where the future holds, but just know that we're very focused here in helping Ukraine try to plan out uh, what is kind of a rational force of the future. And I would anticipate a lot of that will include NATO standard uh, equipment. Okay, let's go out to the phone line. Uh, do we have Oskar Korzynski from the Polish Press Agency? Hi, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you for this. Um, a couple, couple of questions. questions. Mm. So just to clarify, um, is your reason for not providing attackers um, a military reason because you, you think they don't? need them it's not efficient or is it about escalation maybe because uh for example uh jake Sullivan a couple of weeks ago just that providing ukraine this weapon would could lead to world world war three so is that not a consideration and uh, also you were talking about um the shift to long term or medium term <coughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, commitment, commitment to the security of Ukraine, but does it also um, mm, translate to the commitment to the region? Uh, as in, will you keep uh, forces present there for a longer haul? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Oscar, we were having a little trouble hearing you here. There was some echo. So um, hopefully I'll answer the question. So the, the question of an attack comes is essentially, you know, it's a version of the question before. Why have we decided not to provide the uh, attack comes as of yet? I will tell you our primary consideration is uh, our judgment about what is most uh, useful and efficient for what the Ukrainians need for their uh, current purposes, which are to hold in the east and to generate momentum elsewhere uh, in the country. And why do we say that? We consulted very closely with the Ukrainians about the types of, of targets that they needed to be able to prosecute inside Ukrainian uh, territory. The vast majority of those targets uh, were rangeable uh, by uh, High Mars using Gimlers as opposed to uh, the much longer range uh, attackums, um, uh, and so we have been emphasizing providing them Gimlers. And by the way, I should I should note. It's had an extraordinary effect. Uh, the I think as all of your reporting and other reporting has has suggested, um, you know, this isn't just an average rocket. This is the equivalent of kind of a two hundred pound precision guided airstrike launched off the back of a truck. Uh, and the Ukrainians have been using this to for precision strikes against command and control uh, facilities, logistical uh, nodes and other sustainment uh, facilities. And it has had the effect, we believe, of frustrating uh, uh, Russia's advances in the east. Um, I think it's really they've the Russians have really slowed down uh, in, the, in the east and it's held uh, uh, Russian assets at risk elsewhere in the country that's very much complicated. Uh, Russia's planning efforts. So it's our assessment that um, the Gimlers are the most important thing to continue emphasizing, and there's a steady flow of those going uh, going to Ukraine. As it relates to your question about, you know, obviously part of this package is, is to signal a long-term commitment to Ukraine. What about the long-term commitment to the broader uh, region, I would assume, to include Poland uh, uh, and other countries on the eastern flank? Um, 
I think as you all saw from the most recent Madrid uh, setting, um, our posture is more robust than it was before this crisis. And, um, you know, before the crisis, we had between 70 and 80,000 forces in the UCOM AOR. We now have around 100,000 uh, forces in the, in, the, uh, in the AOR. We had on any given day around three uh, you know, two brigade uh, combat teams or three brigade combat teams. Now we're at five. We will be at a steady state of four. Uh, one of those will be headquartered in Poland, uh, as it currently is. Another one will be headquartered in Romania, but they'll be available uh, to do exercises and reinforce all up and down uh, the eastern flank. So whether that be, uh, you know, Poland and, and the Baltic states or whether it be uh, in places like Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, uh, Slovakia, uh, et cetera. We've also put a couple of additional uh, D DDGs are going to be flowing into Spain. Uh, those are naval assets. We're going to be putting uh, uh, F-35s uh, into the into the UK, uh, and there are other uh, movements as well. And I think one of the things that we've demonstrated through this crisis is that a lot of the investments we made in um, in improving our forward posture and our infrastructure after the 2014 uh, uh, illegal annexation of Crimea and the beginning of the violence uh, in the Donbass, a lot of that work uh, has paid off because of what it allowed us to do early in the crisis is to nimbly move around uh, uh, UCOM forces, forces that may have been further back were able to flow forward very quickly because the infrastructure was there, the prepositioned equipment uh, was there. And so I would say that it's important, as we, even as we look at the eastern flank, to not only look at the capabilities that are resident every single day in those countries, but the ability of the United States and NATO to surge forces forward. And one of the things that we came out of the Madrid summit with was a commitment, not just by the United States, but other countries like Germany, the UK, Canada, et cetera, to put in place uh, commitments and infrastructure to be able to rapidly surge forward into the eastern flank. So I think that is signaling a long-term commitment, not just from the United States, but from the rest of NATO uh, to security in the east. Okay, we have time for just a couple more. Let's go to Fadi and then go back to uh, Carla. Thank you. Thank you for Quick question on Iran and two on Ukraine. On Iran, you, you just mentioned that uh, the U.S. communicated to the Iranians that uh, we will not tolerate any attacks on uh, U.S. troops. Was that made directly through direct channels to Iran? And then on Ukraine, the first thing on the f uh, funding for training, uh, is this, since we're talking about long term here, is it only training on equipment or does it involve other things like tactical fighting? And then you said, since this is a long term commitment, um, you're not presuming any outcome. However, most oftentimes wars end with political settlements. And huge, say huge security uh, assistance like this impact at the end of the day political calculus. So why don't you factor in the possibility of being able to have an impact on Russians willing to be engaged in political dialogue to end this war? Yeah. So on that, actually, I think we're in exactly the same place as your question suggested. As really, I made clear a bunch of times that a big part of the reason for this commitment is actually to challenge Putin's theory of victory. Right? His theory of victory is that he can outlast everybody. Packages like this that signal we're not just providing assistance to Ukraine right now, but it's going to be a steady stream of assistance that will stretch out over many months and years, is precisely challenging Putin's miscalculation, we believe, that he can just grind it out and wait it out. Uh, so it is uh, uh, supposed to impact uh, his calculus. Um, we're also, th largely through our PDA packages, trying to affect the calculus in the nearer term, obviously, by enabling the Ukrainians to defend the territory they have, push back where they can, so that when and if negotiations start, whenever that happens, they have the best hand uh, at the negotiating table. So we're very mindful of that as well. The point I was making is that the USAI package matters essentially no matter what world we end up in. Uh, so clearly we hope that the USAI package helps to send a particular signal to Putin that he can't just wait everybody out and that hopefully incentivizes uh, Russia to stop the fighting uh, and to, uh, and to uh, uh, get down to negotiations. But if it doesn't, and the fighting, continu and the fighting continues, then the assistance uh, continues to be relevant. If it does incentivize him to, to uh, strike a deal, the assistance is still relevant because Ukraine will have to hedge against the possibility that Russia could do uh, this again. On, uh, on Iran, um, I'm, I'm not going to go much further than I already said. We, we have past messages. I'm not going to go through uh, exactly what channels. We have lots of ways of communicating to them, and we have uh, tapped all of those channels to make it clear uh, to, to uh, the Iranians that what they're doing is unacceptable. 
uh, and that we will uh, defend ourselves uh, where necessary. I should say, by the way, um, you know, the other piece of Iran uh, uh, business uh, right now is the, the conversation about the JCPOA, the nuclear deal, and I should just make clear that what the strikes last night illustrated is that, you know, our commitment uh, to push back against Iran's support for terrorism, militancy, and the threats that they uh, engage in against our people in the region or elsewhere are not linked to wherever we end up on the nuclear deal. Uh, so there's the nuclear, nuclear diplomacy lane. Um, you know, the president has been uh, pretty clear, the administration has been pretty clear uh, that in the event uh, that Iran moves back into compliance uh, with the JCPOA, that's in our interest because it pushes Iran further away from a nuclear uh, weapons capability. But whether the JCPOA is 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 reborn or not, uh, it actually has nothing to do uh, with our uh, willingness and resolve uh, to defend ourselves. And I think the strike last night was a pretty clear communication to the Iranians that these things are are uh, are on different tracks. Lastly, just on training on equipment and tactics, I will say that um, you know for the most part we've been prioritizing training Ukrainian troops on the systems that they need to be able to very rapidly uh, employ in the field. Obviously, with these systems, we'll have a longer uh, time period. Those interactions do have uh, uh, the ability um, to, you know, pass on not just the, the technical details, but also tactics, techniques, and procedures, um, uh, you know, how to use these in combination with other capabilities. So we'll do our best uh, to make sure that we're, we're kind of synergizing the, the training in that way. Okay, we'll go to the final question, BOA. Thank you for doing this. I have one on Ukraine, and then I'd like to ask one on Taiwan, if I may. Um, so, on Ukraine, the Pentagon suggested that 10 Switchblade 600s were going to be going into Ukraine. Have any of those arrived in theater? And will this package include uh, any Switchblade 600s? Yeah, so this package doesn't. It includes uh, uh, Puma UAS systems and then also some additional parts for uh, for Scan Eagle, um, uh, but it does not include uh, Switchblade 600s. And as it relates to the actual delivery of the Switchblades, I'll have to get back to you. I don't have that information in front of me. You had a question on Taiwan? Yes. Um, We've seen this just this week that the PLA is still maintaining an aggressive tempo, um, flying close to Taiwan. Uh, has the Pentagon seen any indications that this is going to slow down, and should we view this as the new normal over in Taiwan at the Taiwan Strait? Yeah, so our assessment, I mean, I think we're still, uh, we'll still uh, have to see what settles out and what the new normal looks like. I'll tell you what we've seen uh, thus far. Um, the tempo of their activities is less than it was uh, in the immediate aftermath of Speaker Pelosi's visit, but it is still uh, higher than historical norms. Uh, and they have clearly used uh, this particular incident uh, to try to uh, essentially de facto erase uh, the norm of the center line, for example, of crossing between this, you know, the, the median position between mainland China and the island uh, of Taiwan. Uh, they have been more active in the air. They have been more active at sea. Um, uh, so I think we should anticipate that whatever the ultimate level ends up being, it will be higher than it was before. And that speaks to your question about uh, the new normal. Um, and we'll continue to adjust our activities uh, to make sure that wherever uh, China uh, ends up settling, that we make clear a couple of things. Uh, we remain committed to, to uh, defending our allies and partners in the region. Uh, we remain committed to uh, a, a stable, free, and open Indo-Pacific, which is, I think, an interest that uh, all our allies and partners uh, in the region um, uh, subscribe to, um, and that we will continue to operate uh, in the air, at sea, wherever international law uh, uh, allows, and that will include uh, freedom of navigation operations, Taiwan Strait uh, transits, uh, uh, and other activities. So, look, I, our view of this is that, um, you know, China took the speaker's visit as an excuse to manufacture a crisis and to set a new normal, and that uh, what we need to do is to, sh is to show uh, that we and the rest of the international community will not be coerced. Uh, that what, what Beijing wants is for the international community to react to their new normal by taking a step back and saying, whoa, uh, uh, you know, we don't want any piece of that. And our reaction is not to invite uh, conflict or uh, to generate unnecessary frictions, but to basically uh, make clear that Beijing's gambit isn't going to pay off, that if their goal was to coerce us in the international community uh, to back off, it's not going to work. Dr. 
Nicole, can I ask you one more about Iran, just quickly? Can you explain what, why, you know, there have been a number of attacks by these Iranian-backed groups against U.S. forces and facilities in Iraq and Syria uh, in the last year or so, including a, a, a pretty egregious one against ATG last October, and there hasn't been a U.S. kinetic response like last night. Can you just explain why the U.S. decided to respond to these August 15th when they're, they don't seem to have been so far out of the norm from the other ones we've seen? Yeah, I'm going to be a little careful here. Uh, uh, due to classification issues, but I'll say this. A part, of, part of it's an accumulation um, that we want, uh, we don't want Iran to draw the wrong conclusion that they can j continue just doing this and, and get away with it. But part of it was also the nature of the attacks uh, on the 15th, the fact that they were coordinated against two uh, U.S. facilities at the same time, uh, the fact that we believe we have Iran dead to rights uh, on, uh, on attribution, uh, the, the, U the UAV parts that we've collected, for example, traced directly back uh, to uh, Tehran. Um, so I think... Our concern was that um, this might be an indication that, it, that Iran intends to do more of this, and we wanted to disabuse them of any sense that that was a good idea. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate it.